Good evening, gentle reader, and welcome to Rose Reads Novels, the channel that I've established for the simple reason that I asked myself, what could I be doing to help in the coronavirus crisis? And the answer came to me immediately. Reading out loud on YouTube obscure novels from the 18th century. It seems obvious when you put it like that. And so this is what I'm going to do. I like reading aloud. Some of you may enjoy listening to me reading out loud. It's always possible that there is in fact a demand for these things. Who knows? I guess we'll find out. If you do enjoy doing, hearing me read this, then I would ask you to consider donating to some local business that needs your support, such as an independent bookshop, or contributing to um, coronavirus relief, um, if you are able or interested in doing so. Um, but anyway, that's entirely your choice. I am here to read to you Evelina in instalments. And Evelina is a great novel by Fanny Burney. It was published in 1778 and is really the sequel to a novel that Fanny Burney wrote much earlier about Evelina's mother, um, but her father didn't approve of her writing and forced her to burn the manuscript, which is of course a great tragedy, but later on she came back to the story and the characters and she wrote the story of Evelina. Fans of Jane Austen will probably recognise in it um, themes similar to Northanger Abbey about a young innocent girl going out into the world and finding her way there, um, finding romance, meeting different characters, um, getting into satirical scrapes. Evelina is relatively short for 18th century novel um, and it's quite light and frothy though again if you're used to things like um, modern historical romances or reading Jane Austen, there is quite a lot of sentimentality in it. Um, but hopefully you will still really enjoy it. I have here my rather ancient and extremely battered copy of Evelina, and hopefully not too many pages will be damaged, but I guess we'll find out. Um, I also have a cup of tea, La Saint Souchon, and I recommend that you get the same. And um, I'm going to start off with the first few um, letters, because Evelina is an epistolary novel, which means it was written in letters between characters. Um, Sense of Sensibility also started in letters between characters. Um, and I think I've talked quite enough at this point about the background to this novel. Um, I hope you enjoy hearing me read it. Thank you. Evelina by Francis Burney Letter the First. Lady Howard to the Reverend Mr. Villars. Howard Grove, Kent. Can anything, my good sir, be more painful to a friendly mind than a necessity of communicating disagreeable intelligence? Indeed, it is sometimes difficult to determine whether the relator or the receiver of evil tidings is most to be pitied. I have just had a letter from Madame Duval. She is totally at a loss in what manner to behave. She seems desirous to repair the wrong she has done, yet wishes the world to believe her blameless. She would fain cast upon another the odium of those misfortunes for which she alone is answerable. Her letter is violent, sometimes abusive, and that of you, you to whom she is under obligations which are greater even than her faults, but to whose advice she wickedly imputes all the sufferings of her much injured daughter, the late Lady Belmont. The chief purport of her writing I will acquaint you with. The letter itself is not worth your notice. She tells me that she has for many years past been in continual expectation of making a journey to England, which prevented her writing for information concerning this melancholy subject by giving her hopes of making personal inquiries. But family occurrences have still detained her in France, which country she now sees no prospect of quitting. She has therefore lately used her utmost endeavours to obtain a faithful account of whatever related to her ill-advised daughter, the result of which giving her some reason to apprehend that upon her deathbed she bequeathed an infant to the orphan world. She most graciously says that if you, with whom she understands the child is placed, will procure authentic proofs of its relationship to her, you may send it to Paris, where she will properly provide for it. This woman is undoubtedly, at length, self-convicted of her most unnatural behaviour. It is evident from her writing that she is still as vulgar and illiterate as when her first husband, Mr Evelyn, had the weakness to marry her. Nor does she at all apologise for addressing herself to me, though I was only once in her company. 
her letter has excited in my daughter Mervyn a strong desire to be informed of the motives which induced Madame Duval to abandon the unfortunate Lady Belmont, at a time when a mother's protection was peculiarly necessary for her peace and for her reputation. Notwithstanding I was personally acquainted with all the parties concerned in that affair, the subject always appeared of too delicate a nature to be spoken of with the principals. I cannot therefore satisfy Mrs. Mervyn otherwise than by applying to you. By saying that you may send the child, Madame Duval aims at conferring where she most owes obligation. I pretend not to give you advice. You, to whose generous protection this helpless orphan is indebted for everything, are the best and only judge of what she ought to do. But I am much concerned at the trouble and uneasiness with which this unworthy woman may occasion you. My daughter and my granddaughter join with me in desiring to be most kindly remembered to the amiable girl, and they bid me remind you that the annual visit to Howard Grove, which we were formerly promised, has been discontinued for more than four years. I am, dear sir, with great regard, your most obedient friend and servant, M. Howard. Letter the Second Mr. Villars to Lady Howard Berry Hill, Dorsetshire your ladyship did but too well foresee the perplexity and uneasiness of which Madame Duval's letter has been productive. However, I ought rather to be thankful that I have so many years remained unmolested than repine at my present embarrassment, since it proves at least that this wretched woman is at length awakened to remorse. In regard to my answer, I must humbly request your aunt ladyship to write to this effect that I would not, upon any account, intentionally offend Madame Duval, but that I have weighty, nay, unanswerable reasons for detaining her granddaughter at present in England, the principle of which is that it was the earnest desire of one to whose will she owes implicit duty. Madame Duval may be assured that she meets with the utmost attention and tenderness, that her education, however short of my wishes, almost exceeds my abilities. And I flatter myself, when the time arrives, that she shall pay her duty to her grandmother, Madame Duval, will find no reason to be dissatisfied with what has been done for her. Your ladyship will not, I am sure, be surprised at this answer. Madame Duval is by no means a proper companion or guardian for a young woman. She is at once uneducated and unprincipled, ungentle in temper and unamiable in her manners. I have long known that she has persuaded herself to harbour an aversion for me unhappy woman. I can only regard her as an object of pity. I dare not hesitate at a request from Mrs. Mervyn, yet in complying with it I shall for her own sake be as concise as I possibly can. Since the cruel transactions which proceeded from the birth, the birth of my ward can afford no entertainment to a mind so humane as hers. Your ladyship may probably have heard that I had the honour to accompany Mr. Evelyn, the grandfather of my young charge, when upon his travels in the capacity as tutor. His unhappy marriage, immediately upon his return to England with Madame Duval, then a waiting girl at a tavern, contrary to the advice and entreaties of all his friends, among whom I myself was the most urgent, induced him to abandon his native land and fix his abode in France. Thither he was followed by shame and repentance, feelings which his heart was not framed to support, for notwithstanding he had been too weak to resist at the allurements of beauty, which nature, though a niggard to her of every other boon, had, with a lavish hand, bestowed on his wife. Yet he was a young man of excellent character, until thus unaccountably infatuated, of unblemished conduct. He survived this ill-judged marriage but two years. Upon his deathbed, with an unsteady hand, he wrote the following note. My friend, forget your resentment in favour of your humanity. A father, trembling for the welfare of his child, bequeaths her to your care. O oh, Villas, hear, pity, and relieve me. Had my circumstances permitted me, I should have answered these words by an immediate journey to Paris but I was obliged to act by the agency of a friend who was upon the spot and present at the opening of the will. Mr. Evelyn left to me a legacy of a thousand pounds and the sole guardianship of his daughter's person till her eighteenth year. 
conjuring me in the most affectionate terms to take the charge of her education till she was able to act with propriety for herself. But in regard to fortune, he left her wholly dependent on her mother, to whose tenderness he earnestly recommended her. Thus, though he would not, to a woman low-bred and illiberal as Mrs. Evelyn, trust the conduct and morals of his daughter, he nevertheless thought proper to secure to her the respect and duty, which from her own child was certainly her due. But unhappily it never occurred to him that the mother, on her part, could fail in affection or justice. Miss Evelyn, madam, from the second to the eighteenth year of her life, was brought up under my care, and except when at school under my roof. I need not speak to your ladyship of the virtues of that excellent young creature. She loved me as her father, nor was Mrs. Villers less valued by her, while to me she became so dear that her loss was little less afflicting than that which I have since sustained of Mrs. Villers herself. At that period of her life we parted. Her mother, then married to Monsieur Duval, sent for her to Paris. How often have I since regretted that I did not accompany her thither? Protected and supported by me, the misery and disgrace which awaited her might perhaps have been avoided. But, to be brief, Madame Duval, at the instigation of her husband, earnestly, or rather tyrannically, endeavoured to effect a union between Miss Evelyn and one of his nephews. And when she found her power inadequate to her attempt, Enraged at her non-compliance, she treated her with the grossest unkindness, and threatened her with poverty and ruin. Miss Evelyn, to whom wrath and violence had hitherto been strangers, soon grew weary of such usage, and rashly and without a witness, consented to a private marriage with Sir John Belmont, a very profligate young man, who had but too successfully found means to insinuate himself into her favour. He promised to conduct her to England. He did. Oh, madam, you know the rest. Disappointed of the fortune he expected by the inexorable rancour of the Duvals, he infamously burnt the certificate of marriage, and denied that they had ever been united. She flew to me for protection. With what mixed transports of joy and anguish did I again see her? By my advice, she endeavoured to procure proofs of her marriage, but in vain. Her credulity had been no match for his art. Everybody believed her innocent from the guiltless tenor of her unspotted youth, and from the known libertinism of her barbarous betrayer. Yet her sufferings were too acute for her tender frame, and at the same moment that gave birth to her infant, put an end at once to the sorrows and the life of its mother. The rage of Madame Duval at her elopement abated not while this injured victim of cruelty yet drew breath. She probably intended in time to have pardoned her, but time was not allowed. When she was informed of her death, I have been told, agonies of grief and remorse with which she was seized occasioned her a severe fit of illness. But from the time of her recovery to the date of her letter to your ladyship, I had never heard that she manifested any desire to be made acquainted with the circumstances which attended the death of Lady Belmont and the birth of her helpless child. That child, madame, shall never, while life is lent me, know the loss she has sustained. I have cherished, succoured and supported her from her earliest infancy to her sixteenth year, and so amply has she repaid my care and affection that my fondest wish is now circumscribed by the desire of bestowing her on one who may be sensible of her worth, and then sinking to eternal rest in her arms. Thus it has happened that the education of the father, daughter and granddaughter has devolved upon me. What infinite misery have the first two caused me? Should the fate of the dear survivor be equally adverse, how wretched will be the end of my cares, the end of my days! Even had Madame Duval merited the charge she claims, I fear my fortitude would have been unequal to such a party. But, being such as she is, not only my affection but my humanity recoils at the barbarous idea of deserting the sacred trust reposed in me. Indeed, I could but ill support her former yearly visits to the respectable mansion at Howard Grove, Pardon me, dear madam, and do not think me insensible of the honour which your ladyship's condescension confers upon us both. But so deep is the impression which the misfortunes of her mother have made on my heart, that she does not even for a moment quit my sight without exciting apprehensions and terrors which almost overpower me. Such, madam, is my tenderness, and such my weakness. But she is the only tie I have upon earth, and I trust to your ladyship's goodness not to judge of my feelings with severity. I beg leave to present my humble respects 
to Mrs. and Miss Mervyn, and have the honour to be, Madam, your ladyship's most obedient and most humble servant, Arthur Villas. And here I will pause after the first instalment of Evelina. You've got a lot of backstory there, maybe a family tree that you would want to draw in your, your little notebook that you will be keeping to make notes on this august occasion of reading Evelina. Next time we will see, will Mr Villas ever let Evelina go? Tune in tomorrow. <laughs>